Uh, my name is Andrew Sears. I'm the Dean of the College of Information Sciences and Technology. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you here today uh, to the first Penn State Startup Week. Uh, today we conclude a week-long celebration of entrepreneurship and innovation, and we're really pleased to see so many of you join us. Uh, since 2012, IST has been organizing Startup Week. Uh, it was originally focused very much on technology innovation, and this year we've expanded and we've embraced a campus-wide model where we're celebrating innovation in technology, in healthcare, in education, the arts, sustainability, and a number of other areas. Over the past four days, we have really brought entrepreneurship to every corner of the campus. We've had a uh, presence in, I believe it's 36 buildings. We've had 13 different units involved in organizing events. There have been over 80 events with 50 speakers, and one of the things I'm, I'm most pleased about is that over 30 of those speakers were Penn State alums. So today, we're bringing uh, together some speakers from a variety of companies and organizations, including Land's End, Weebly, Undertone, Reddit, and many others, so they can share their, their experiences, their insights with you, with you, our students. And I encourage you to, to make the most of today, ask questions, uh, don't let them get out of here without answering a bunch of your questions. Before we get started, I have some, some people and organizations I should recognize. Uh, we have to thank General Electric, IBM, and Verizon, who all provided sponsorship for the week. We want to thank Roland Creative, who helped us reimagine Startup Week and redesign all of the materials you see scattered across campus. Uh, Chris Krieger, who is a volunteer who actually led much of what you've, you've seen and experienced across campus this, this week. Uh, the faculty and staff of the uh, College of Information Sciences and Technology played a critical role. Uh, having been the foundation for the event, they helped us expand the event and figure out how we would, would uh, embrace the entire campus. And we also have to thank all of our colleagues from across campus. Uh, this was a, a huge undertaking that got, quite frankly, a rather late start. Uh, and we had a, a lot of faculty and staff from across campus from many different units who stepped forward, volunteered their time and energy to help make all of this possible. So today, uh, our, our conversation is facilitated by Carolyn Donaldson. Carolyn is, a, is the Community Engagement Manager for WPSU. And formerly, she spent more than 20 years as a C CBS news anchor with WTAJ in State College, Altoona, and Johnstown. She serves on the Sheets Entrepreneurial Center for Excellence Community Advisory Board and is a part-time lecturer in media studies at Penn State Altoona. And with, a freelance, with freelance experience in media, marketing, and public relations, she is a self-proclaimed entrepreneur wannabe. So please join me in welcoming Carolyn to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dean. Yes, want to be, because I'm like many of you out in the audience, I want to be an entrepreneur. And we are here to hear some unbelievable stories of entrepreneurship, of intrapreneurship, of innovation, of reinvention, of introspection, extraspection. I don't even know all the terms that these guys are going to use today, guys and ladies, but we are in for a treat. And for those of you in the audience, um, we're excited that you're here, and we're going to try to keep you here for a couple of reasons. And for those of you that are watching us on the live stream, this is going out all over the world, really, to anybody who's tuning in, all the Penn State alums out there, we thank you so much for being a part of that. Those folks who couldn't get here, they still are being able to hear some catalysts of change here and hear some of these innovative and creative stories so that we can be sparked to move that wannabe title to entrepreneur or whatever the title may be in the next century. So thank you so much for having me as a part of this. A couple of housekeeping chores. Number one, of course, your cell phones. We want to make sure they're on at least a mute or airplane mode because that's really embarrassing and not fun for anybody up here to be able to hear that lovely ringtone. And we know there's a variety out there from all the entrepreneurs who have invented ringtones, right? So make sure they're in that mode. And also, when you came in, hopefully you all received a ticket. What happens through the course of this afternoon is you get to gain more of these, and these are your chances to win. For the students out there, this is valuable information, $50 gift cards to Amazon, which of course started as an entrepreneur in someone's garage, right? So um, you too can be uh, walk away with some, uh, some um, Amazon gift cards to be able to create or, or further your idea. But what happens is after each session, if you'll stay in place, we'll come around and get you another ticket to keep you coming. And then those of you who come in um, midstream or whatever, will get a ticket. But bottom line is, 
we're going to rack up a lot of tickets here. and We're going to be giving away some uh, good things. Also, make sure to pick up some Startup Week swag on your way out this afternoon when you do finally leave. We'd love for to, to you to spread the, the show of force out there in uh, our blue-white community here about our Startup Week. And uh, we will be hearing from our first two speakers, and then we'll have an ice cream break, um, and then we'll set up for our panel. And then we'll have um, the panel. After the panel, we'll take another break, and that's when we'll start giving out some of our great gift cards and things. So just hopefully you've got that schedule, and I don't have it all memorized to, for memory. But stay with us. We promise it to be very engaging and fun. So without further ado, let me introduce our first of many extraordinary people who are here to uh, we can hopefully glean some information from. Jerome Griffin. Griffith is the chief executive officer president and a member of the Board of Directors of Lands End Incorporated. In this role, he's committed to leveraging Land End's rich heritage now, we know importantly to drive growth and profit opportunities for all aspects of the global brand while remaining true to the brand's core values and customer base. He's definitely going to be the catalyst for reinvention of Land's End. And that's not all he's done. Of course, in his background, he was president and director of Toomey Holdings. I told him I carried Toomey everywhere around the world when I traveled. Those are the best luggage you can possibly uh, have when you're transporting good things from point A to point B. He also has acted, as you can tell by his appearance, on the board of Parsons School of Design since September of 2013 holding positions with Esprit, Tommy Hilfinger, that famous J. Peterman company, and Gap. Ladies and gentlemen, our Penn State proud alum from the science, uh, Bachelor of Science in Marketing from the Pennsylvania State University, I won't say the year, Mr. Jerome Griffith joins us first. Thank you. Thanks. It was 1979. Oh. It was a good year. Wanted me to say. Uh, first of all, thanks for, uh, for coming. It's uh, exciting to be able to spend some time and talk with you guys. Uh, I have to be honest with you, though. I'm not really sure why people ask me to talk. I have never started anything in my life. I have never started a company. Very few original ideas have I ever had. Uh, and you know, they say, you want to be entrepreneurs? I want to be a college student. So uh, let's see if maybe we can help each other. Um, and I was trying to think when they asked me to, to speak, because I love to come back to school and talk, but I wasn't really sure what I was going to talk about. It's like, well, gee, it's startup week. I haven't done a startup, so what should I really begin to talk about? So I racked my brain a little bit, and I thought, well, maybe I'll give you uh, a couple of different experiences from my life that might be helpful as you guys are, are moving through yours. And to start off, just talk a little bit about entrepreneurship. I realized uh, I was talking to some kids earlier, and they, you now can get a degree in entrepreneurship. I didn't know that. So that's pretty cool. So keep that. Because in my job, and <clears throat> you have to think, most of the companies hire me because companies are in dire financial straits. As I've been told, no one's going to hire you if things are going well. They're going to hire you when things aren't going well. Um, so my history has generally been either fixing companies that are broken or divisions that are broken or fixing companies that have financial problems. Um, I thought first, in talking about entrepreneurship, you know, when I was a kid, and they talked about it at school, I was thinking, well, I guess I'm excluded because that means starting a company and I don't have any intention of starting a company. But I found out over the years that's really not true. So a couple of things that I always tell, whether they're employees of mine or, or really direct reports that are running areas, it's like, I really don't want to make any decisions. I want you to make decisions. I don't want to do anything myself. I just want us to agree on what's the strategy and you go out and do it. And I'm not going to sit there and tell you how. But the thing that I would ask is, when you make a mistake, and you will make a mistake, own up to it straight away. It's like, oh, I tried this. It didn't work. I have to change. That's great. The worst thing that can happen is I'm trying this, and I, it's my idea, and I'm going to keep on trying, and I'm going to run the area into the ground because I just won't give it up. When you're running a company and you have people that are entrepreneurs and they go out and they do things on their own, it's very exciting for you because they're really taking control of their business, whether it's a division, an area, a department. It doesn't matter. You can be an entrepreneur at, at any level and go out and just treat it like it's your own. And I've always worked off the 80-20 rule. And it's, an, it's something that they won't teach you in school, but something that you learn as a CEO. You're really rated on getting stuff done. I mean, you're rated on financials at the end of the day. 
your business is your report card and you get a result every day, but you're really rated on getting things done. That, that thing of like get, getting things done, they don't really teach you that in school. You can be a good talker, you can stand up, you can speak, you can have all the right words, all the right phrases, put strategy together. If you don't get things done and you don't move the organization, you're not gonna last very long because they're expecting, and when I say they, they are your shareholders or, and or your employees for you to get things done. So working on the 80-20 rule means I'll make most of my decisions with 80% of the information. I don't need 100% because that last 20% is so painful to get. And I was reading uh, last weekend <coughs> at Amazon, uh, Jeff Bezos' credo is 70-30 rule. I'm like, ooh, 70-30, that's kind of interesting, 10% better. And he values speed. So it's 70-30, you're making all your decisions with 70% of the information, but move your ass and make a decision. I'd rather you be wrong than you be late. So I think that's important when you're thinking about if you're gonna be an entrepreneur in any area of business, whether you're gonna start your own company or work for somebody else, how do I get stuff done and how quickly can I do things? And realize, if I'm making a mistake, what do I do? So when, in talking to some of the guys earlier, they also want to know a little bit of my background. So I, I won't bore you too much with it, but I'm a Penn State alum. Uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. I grew up on a dairy farm uh, in southeastern Pennsylvania. It was, you know, seven days a week. Cows don't take a vacation. Um, first person in my family to go to school or to college. And I got here by, on a scholarship and worked my way through school, I worked a full-time job and just met somebody out here today who's working a full-time job. In fact, he has his own company while he's going to school, which to me is pretty impressive because if you're working a 40-hour work week and you're going to school and you're trying to maintain a GPA, not the easiest thing to do. And it's heartening for me to see that people still do that. I love that. Um, when I graduated from school here, I went to work uh, in, obviously, in retail. So I spent 10 years at Lord & Taylor. Lord & Taylor is a big department store. It was on the rise in the 1980s. And every year I ended up with a job which I was completely unqualified for. And that was the training program. The training program was, we're going to put you somewhere and we're going to see how you do. And you'll figure it out, or you won't. So the training program started out with 62 people in it. Three months later, there were 32 people in it. Six months later, there were 15 people in it. And by the end of the training program, which was five years, there were about 10 people left. Um, and that's how you got weeded out. Mostly, they didn't, the company didn't fire you. You just decided, I don't like this work. And trying to find something that you like, that you really like to do, if I can give you one side piece of advice, find something that you really enjoy. Because then it's not like you're working. And I know everybody says that, and you've probably heard it before, but it's actually true. If you're doing something that you really enjoy, you're not working, it's just what you do. And if I can give you one other piece of advice, which I think uh, is, is important, um, it's always be thankful for what you get and always be grateful for it and show people that, you're, that you are grateful. Because <clears throat> as you grow something, whether you're working in a company or whether you're starting up your own business, the people that are working for you, you know, they're there mostly for you, whether you're a boss in a division or whether you're somebody that just started up a company, they're there for you. And Showing gratitude goes a long way. So when it comes back to startups, I've ended up working with some pretty incredible people. Uh, I work with Don Fisher at The Gap. He started The Gap in 1969. Basically, it was an idea that he and his wife had. And they started the company selling records, not clothing. And they bought the jeans in there because they figured if I sold jeans, kids would come in and buy the records. And that's how they were going to make their money. Didn't work out that way. They had to come up with another strategy. I worked for a while with Tommy Hilfiger, and everybody knows Tommy Hilfiger here, I guess. Yeah? Uh, okay. Fashion designer, relatively large company, multi, multiple billions of dollars in sales. I worked for an extremely short time with Jay Peterman, the guy from Seinfeld. He is a real guy. Uh, he has a farm in Kentucky, which is a lot of fun if you ever go down to Kentucky. Um, and that was an interesting experience. And then I got a chance to work kind of with the founder of Toomey. He was already out of the company when I uh, started working with him, but he was somebody that I could call on and get information from. Now, all of these people either did great things or dumb things. And I wanted to think a little bit about 
what are the things that made them make certain decisions, whether they were good or bad? And it was really two things. One was self-awareness, and the other was situational awareness. So I'm going to give you a few examples of things that people did in order to uh, grow, or in, in some cases ended up shrinking their company, that I was privy to. Because people that are outside of you, meaning they're, they're maybe friends of yours or particularly employees, you get a different perspective when it's not you. If you're the person making the decision, you're always thinking, ooh, I'm going to do the right thing. But other people always have a different perspective. And it's easier to see it when you're not the person that's really making that decision. So I'll talk about the gap a little bit. The gap was a, was an, a place where you know, Don started the company. It grew up to a certain point in the 80s, because it started in 1969. And it was about a half a billion dollars in the, in the early 80s. And Don realized, because it was kind of a crappy store, there were rounders of products and sweatshirts and Levi's sitting there, and everything was always on sale. And Don got it to a certain size. But Don was great, because he realized, I can't get it bigger. I, I'm at the point where I'm done now. And he ended up hiring Mickey Drexler. And that's at the point when Mickey came in, and it was all about jeans, and it was all about white shirts, and they got rid of Levi's, and they did the private label programs. And the company grew exponentially. And Don did what Don was good at. And what Don was good at was real estate. And Don went to and looked at every piece of real estate that that company ever opened. And that's about all that Don did. He was the chairman and the CEO. And he was smart enough and self-aware enough to know, I know what I know. And I also know what I don't know. And he let the person that made the decisions on product be someone that understood product extremely well. And that's, a, that's an area where I would say he did a great job because he was very clear about what do I bring to the company, what am I best at, and he kept you know, the final decision making for himself, obviously, but everything that was going to happen in the world of product and what the company's image was and what it looked like, he was smart enough to give that to somebody else and empower them to make decisions. And that's how Gap grew to a multi-billion dollar company. It was Don and Mickey working together. Now, P.S., they did not like each other uh, because they didn't respect what the other one really brought to the party in certain ways. But at the same time, it was a good symbiotic relationship, and they left each other alone enough in order to grow. Contrast that with um, Jay Peterman. Now, John's a great guy, loved him, very nice gentleman, very great concept. Does anybody, does you guys kind of know what Jay Peterman was? Yeah, no, no. Okay, Jay Peterman was made famous on Seinfeld because Elaine, worked for a mythical guy named Jay Peterman. Um, there really is a Jay Peterman, and he had a catalog company out of Kentucky. And it was a very successful catalog company. And they had lovely stories that they would write uh, in the catalog, and it would romance every product. So whether it was a long duster coat, or they had a whole bunch of stuff from the from, uh, memorabilia from the Titanic, when, when people were diving in the Titanic, they sold stuff like that. It was an eclectic company. It was very odd, as was Peterman. So he wanted to make his company bigger. Well, in order to get bigger, they sold part of the company to a private equity company. So private equity comes in, they have these different backers, they put people on a board of directors, they bring in a president of the company, and I joined as the president of retail. So I asked, you know, how's the company financed? How are we going to do what we're going to do? And they wanted to open up retail stores. Easy. So I went in, and um, we, it was April... I forget the year, 90, 98, I think, April of 98. And there was already a 10-store program to open up stores and, be, um, and supplement the catalog. So it was our third store we were opening, and the, I was there helping them, and there was no product. And I'm like, there's no product. Why isn't there product? So I got on the phone. Hey, where's the shipment? Oh, well, FedEx is supposed to bring it, but they're not going to bring it. Why not? We don't have any money. We didn't pay them. Right. <laughs> No problem. So I called the CFO. John, you got to release the money for FedEx because I got to get the product to open the store. Well, I can't. Why not? We don't have any cash. We don't have any cash. <laughs> he just told me how well we were financed. So I went to Peterman, and his face was as white as a ghost. So I figured, oh, you just got off the phone with the CFO, huh? So he was, we were in dire straits. We had no cash. So 
I said, well, here's how you get cash, because I had taken him to the warehouse, and I was looking at all the product that was in there. We never marked product down. I said, John, look at all this stuff. We've got to mark it down. And John goes, Jerome, these are treasures. <laughs> I'm like, John, these are liabilities. They got to go. Um, that didn't work out. I left six months later. They went bankrupt. He lost the rights to his own name. So that's a situational awareness uh, issue where you don't really understand what's happening with your business. And if you guys are going to start a business, you really have to understand what's going on. And if you don't understand what's going on, get somebody that does and let them run the business. Another good example of that was when I was hired into Tommy Hilfiger, they had a very bad retail business, very bad. And the company was good. It was a $2 billion company, had been going in a growth trajectory for several years. And they, they knew inherently that the business model was shifting from wholesale to retail, meaning instead of selling to department stores, because you're not going to make a lot of money doing that, that curve was going to drop off. And the next curve was going to be direct to consumer, and you're running your own stores. So they hired me to open up stores and make them profitable. And in order to do that, there were several things that needed to be done, things that had to be done differently. And the company said, yes, 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 we want to change. Yes, 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 we totally get it. Yes, we, need, we, we do. So throughout a course of a year, I put together a plan and laid out, these are the things you need to do. And one of the things was you had to change how you flow merchandise and how you design merchandise. So I was sitting at a meeting with the CEO and Tommy. And they had the guy that actually ran the merchandise was sitting there as well. And I said, so here's what you need to do. You need to change these things. And the guy that runs the merchandise goes, yeah, I don't want to do that. And I said, but your program won't work if you don't change. And Tommy goes, well, you heard what he said. He doesn't want to do it. So anyway, two years later, that company was delisted and it was off the stock exchange, and one of their subsidiaries bought the main company because it couldn't sustain, and Tommy also now has no control over his own name. So another situation where you don't have a good handle on what's happening, you have to have situational awareness if you're going to run a company, and you have to understand what am I good at, what am I not good at, and how do I manage that with others. So anyway, having said that, I've talked a little bit. Normally, uh, I would talk more, but they said, let's leave some time at the end for questions. So I'm going to open it up to questions from the group. And um, if you guys have anything you want to know from either my background or from, um, from um, you know, really anything, fire away. What's a... Uh, oh. <laughs> What's, what's a common mistake that you often see that people make when they start new businesses? I'm sorry, could you say again? What's a common mistake that you often see? Uh, um, I think this, there's a lot. I mean, if, if you look at the statistics, you know, most companies that start fail. Um, and it's for many reasons. Either the idea wasn't great to start off with, execution of what you were doing wasn't really great, uh, the people that you hired weren't really right. Your financing, you didn't have financing, uh, or how you finance wasn't right. There's no really, there's no one thing that I've seen that's that's consistent. It's a multitude of things. And realize, in in my world, I actually see more companies that fail later on. And thinking in in my world today, uh, and talking with with Wells Fargo a few weeks ago. They estimated that a full 20 to 25 percent of the companies that they deal with in the world of retail will go bankrupt in the next 12 months because there is such a disruption in the marketplace out there between stores having overexpanded and having had too much real estate, at the same time having internet companies grow and grow. And what's interesting, the internet companies now that are pure play internet companies are actually wanting to get into the store business because they're realizing that uh, they need to have a physical, a physical presence as well. So you see companies that have not been able to adapt to the changing marketplace fail. And if, I, if there's any one thing that I see out there, it's understanding what's happening in your marketplace and make sure that you're putting your investments where you need to in order to stay current. 
Jerome, yeah. can I piggyback off that with yeah. your Land's End now and the Sears? <laughs> That's what holding. we're doing there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to ask for those who aren't familiar, can you give us an upgrade and tell us what you can about where Land's sure. End is going now? Sure, Land's End was a company founded in 1963, started by a guy that was a yachtsman. And he was a uh, world class and had competed in the Olympics in racing boats. And he opened up a business selling um, like toggles and ropes and sails, wasn't selling clothing. They came out with a jacket a couple of years into it, and the jacket was weatherproof. And the jacket sold out. And he got an idea of like, hey, maybe I could make more clothing. So that grew and grew and grew as a catalog business. And, and this guy's name was Gary Comer, and Gary was pretty brilliant. They were always new, new. They always innovated and came out with new things. They started selling online in 1995. Sad story, Gary got cancer. And this was in the late 90s. And there was a guy that was running the company named Dave Dyer. He was the CEO. And Gary said to Dave, I want to sell the company because I don't want my family to have to deal with running a company when I'm gone. Uh, I want to have the cash. So the company got sold to Sears. And Sears was the only bidder for the company. And it was sold for $2.2 billion. And at the time, they were doing $1.4 billion in sales. Sears immediately stopped innovation took their products, put it into Sears. Sales went up for a short time. They went from $1.4 to $1.7 billion over the course of about six years uh, when it was private with Sears. And what happened at that point in time, they were not investing in the company. They stopped being first. They stopped innovating. They were just taking cash out. Three years later, Eddie Lampert comes in, who owns Kmart, and buys Sears. And Eddie was one of the first people that started the concept of hedge funds. He came from Goldman Sachs. Eddie was also the first person to make a billion dollars personally in a year running a hedge fund. So, super smart guy. But what's happening in the marketplace? You're owning Sears. Sears is anchoring many regional shopping centers. Less and less people are buying in regional shopping centers. So they begin to shrink, and it begins to shrink. And then he comes up with the idea that not only is my business gone down, but I have an asset. My asset is land. I actually own it. So he's come up with another um, company now called Seritage, where they're going to repurpose many of the Sears stores, and Sears is getting smaller and smaller. What they did with Land's Inn, Land's Inn got, uh, what's the word? It, it, it IPO'd, so it went public again in 2014. But because of a couple of tough management decisions and wrong CEOs, I'm the third CEO in three years of a publicly traded company. And this is a company that has seen slowly over the course of time their sales decline from a billion seven to a billion three. At the same time, rapidly their profits have declined from making about $200 million EBITDA to last year was 39, and net income was, was, uh, was negative. And what's happened is that company hasn't kept, for a few things, it hasn't kept up with the times, it hasn't invested in technology, it hasn't also seen itself as an e-commerce company. 87% of everything that lands in sales is sold by someone going click. And we have all that data of all these customers since 1995. And the company sees itself, though, not as an e-commerce company, but as a catalog company. And we're in the beginning stages of a major turnaround of how the company looks at itself. Uh, because it has so many assets, it doesn't even know it has these assets. And because they've made some bad management decisions, uh, meaning direction of company, uh, the company's profitability has suffered. So we'll go from last year of losing money to this year, and I've only been there not even 50 days yet, but this year we'll make money again, just because of doing certain things and pulling certain levers that you can in order to get the company profitable again. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean it'll work. So yes, everybody thinks, oh, we'll hire this guy. He knows how to turn around companies, so he'll do it. Maybe, maybe not. There are no guarantees in life. You have no idea what's going to happen in the marketplace. So if everything's the same, it's golden. If things change and I'm unaware of it, it's not. And that's, again, being aware of what is the situation in which you're working. Does that explain? OK, so as a follow-up, i got to ask this. I'm sure you're thinking this. <laughs> Um, I'll play devil's I didn't, advocate. I didn't see Why her. did you take this job? My goodness gracious, 50 days in and you've got all this. Because you are the turnaround guy then. You're, the, you're seeing an opportunity. You're seeing your I like to work. So when I, okay. My last company, we had 
it was again, it was losing money when I took it over. Um, we changed that, grew it up, went public, and then I sold it to another company. So I kind of retired last August. And then my wife and I went, got on our Harley and we went around America. And as I was thinking, I was like, I think I want to work again. So this was a, a situation where, you know, it's, it's a company in dire straits. And quite honestly, you know, it's in the middle of a cornfield in Wisconsin. It has so many assets. It has $1.3 billion of e-commerce business. It's like, oh my God, other companies would kill to have that. And we have it already. We're just not running it right. So it seems something that it's like, okay, it's doable, I can fix it. If it wasn't fixable, like, there's plenty of jobs I wouldn't take. All right, I'll, I'll say that's a true Penn State answer, though, too. Being an alum, you have that good work ethic, right, guys, who are Penn Staters out there? I would, I would tell you, and you're not exaggerating that, many, many times I have said, people from this place, you got the best work ethic. They will work, so they're good to hire. Uh, I work for a company that uh, has been a catalog company for years, and uh, we sell online as well. But there's been a tremendous amount of time, effort, and money spent, and it's still going on right now, to not only upgrade the technology, but to change the way internally we think mm -hmm. from everything from naming of products to, you know, all that stuff that you, you have to think e-com first now. You don't think catalog and then repurpose yeah. it. Are you yeah. encountering those same things? Yeah, we're, uh, you know, I put together like five strategies for them. One of them is to be a digitally driven company. And within that, there's lots of layers. And it's not just, do I have the latest technology? Because you'll always have technology, but technology will always change. So in, in thinking of CapEx and how much money you're putting into capital expenditures, it's like, Years ago, you'd be opening stores, and it's like, okay, I'm going to depreciate the stores over 10 years, the life of the lease, blah, blah, blah. I know it's a good investment. But today, when you're putting money into technology, you almost have to say, that's done, baby. I already spent that money, so I've got to keep a lookout for, for what is the next big thing. And I would say the marketplace represents maybe a third of the issue that this company would face today. Your internal culture represents two-thirds of the issue because it's how people think. And you've got to make sure that people all think in the right way. And that's when I speak with, with people that I work with. It's as long as we agree on the strategy, we're all good. So go do. But the big thing is, do we all agree on the strategy first in how you're going to transform the company? Because if you don't have agreement there, it's not going to happen. And as you guys are, are working in your own companies, and let's say you're starting up a company today, Think of Jeff Bezos, idea, I'm going to be the biggest book company in the world. Then it's like, I'm going to be the biggest book company and CD company in the world. And that guy's mindset has changed year after year after year to, I'm just going to be the biggest company in the world, do everything. So when he started out selling books, he wasn't thinking, oh, someday I'll be streaming live on television with my original programming. He didn't get there. But it's the difference between drafting a strategy and crafting a strategy. Because when you put one together, it's fine for a finite point in time. But you should always come back and look and say, hey, what's working and what's not? What things do I change to do and do more of? And what stuff do I dump? And many people hate to dump stuff. To go back and say, oh, that's not working anymore. I'm just not going to do it. Oh, my god. We're transforming at, my, at uh, Lands and we're transforming from a legacy system to Oracle. So we're maybe one third through the ERP system. We're, now we're working on the, the merchandising system. And I said, and they were talking about data transfer, and I said, hmm, okay, well, why is that such an issue? Well, we're transferring all the SKUs. Yeah, all the SKUs from when? From all time. Like, <laughs> since 63? <laughs> They're like, uh-huh. And I'm like, that's not a good idea. How many SKUs is that? Eight million. And I'm like, I don't think you need to transfer eight million SKUs over and, and have the historical data. But, People hate to throw stuff away. It's like your attic. It's like, get the crap out of the attic. And, and your best companies will always reinvent themselves, and they'll always be very self-aware of what's happening with this company today. Your worst companies will refuse to change. And re in refusing to change, you'll get killed. Because business is not static. It's evolving all the time. One more question. Jerome, quick question. I've personally done turnarounds for 32 years, 
You mentioned you just recently retired, now you're jumping back in. Is it for the pure adrenaline rush of doing yet one more turnaround, or is it your passion for retail? It's a cash. you back. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I just like what, I'm do, what I do. Uh, I have a good time working with people. And quite honestly, waking up in the morning and not really knowing what your goals are for the day, that's tough for me, so it's nice to have things to, to, to go and do. And um, I, I like working in the industry. It's fun to me. And I figure, you know, if you wake up, and it's not, you ever wake up and it's like, oh my God, I gotta go to work today, I hate this. I always tell employees, if you wake up like that, do us a favor, don't come. Just go do something else, because you won't be a positive influence in the organization. You want to, you know, you want people to wake up and say, oh, I think I can go do this today. And then they don't feel like there's like a brick hanging over their head if they don't get it done. You know, you do your best every day. It's, a, it's the best you can do. And I, you know, as I said, if, if you hired me as the guy that's going to give you three or four percent a year, like wrong guy, because I'm going to get bored really quickly. I like to have complex problems. And if you run a company, everything is complex. You're juggling lots of balls all the time. And you, it, there are complex situations that you have to kind of put together and then be able to explain it. And realize, if you can't explain something in 60 seconds, you don't understand it. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Jerome Griffith. Thank you. Thank wow. You. Very good. I think this is all your flair, your swag. And I think as proud Penn Staters, perhaps the greatest thing we could do to this great alum is maybe check out Land's End, right? We could start a whole new trend here of uh